No. Deep breaths. Comedy Legends Week trundles inexorably on. Like a massive train, slowly but uncontrollably, rolling towards an unsuspecting village. Today's incumbent in the chair of mirth is a man who... Well, what can we say? Uh, uh, children's book writer, novelist, uh, travel documentarian, activist, film star... And, uh, oh yes, uh, writer and performer in the Beatles of comedy. Monty Python's Flying Circus. He is here. If I carry on with this introduction, we're eating into precious time with Mr. Michael Paling. Good no, morning. I I'd rather just sit and listen to Bowie, actually. But <laughs> Phil, was he an activist as well? I think he's worn the aftershave once or twice. I don't, I, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that uh, he's uh, come out for some decent causes in the past. I'm but an aquavit. An aquavit. An aqueduct. It's interesting, isn't it? I love all those things. Aquavit, grappa, you know all that. Do you love those things? <laughs> What's an aquavit? Aquavit, uh, it's a Swedish, uh, Scandinavian spirit. Is it? Yeah, they all drink how, aquavit. Well, how have I never had an aquavit? When did you last in Malmö? Well, there you go, you see. Well, what you're talking about some, from somebody who's not particularly well-travelled to somebody oh, who's sorry. famously okay. well-travelled. I'll send you a bottle of aquavit. It's great. You know, oh. Especially in the morning, first thing. Your show will go much better, I tell you. <laughs> Palin sent us a bottle of Aquavit, everybody. This is better than cake, isn't it? What a way to start the programme with a shot of Aquavit. I mean, I mean, obviously, we've all had grappa, of course. Yeah, I've had grappa. Not ten past eight in the morning, but... I can't really drink grappa anymore. It's so fierce. I drank quite a lot of it when I was doing the Hemingway oh, series because yeah. Hemingway was a great grappa man. I love the idea of it, just this stuff made of herbs off the mountain and all that sort of stuff and bits of stalks and leaves and... <laughs> And, you know, just, wow, it knocks your head off. Uh, but most of the rest of your body as well. So. <laughs> I think it was reducing my height. I was so much it. You were withering. You were desiccating. I was, I was withering. I was, I was declining. Anyway. Did you feel that you had to do that to sort of almost, you know, sort of get into the method of Hemingway, sort of to get into his mindset? Y yeah, you do a bit. I mean, I drank quite a bit anyway. <laughs> um, so it was like Hemingway getting into my mindset. But, no, I mean, he, he that particular drink was, was something he really liked. And it was all very much to do with a place yeah. in Spain. That's where he drank yeah. in Spain and Italy. And, you know, out of the heat of battle, he'd have a... He'd have a grapple. Watch a bullfight. He'd have a few grapple while yeah. he's watching a bullfight yeah. or, you know, I don't know, catching a fish or writing a novel. That's it. But in a manly Pen, way. You know, yeah, the manly way. In a very yeah, manly way. Having a ma it's, a, it's a manly drink for a manly man in a manly way. Oh, I catch, but, a, catch a marlin with, a, yeah. with one hand, with a grapple in the yeah, other hand, with right. a pen in your teeth. That's right, absolutely. That's the way to live, that's though, the way isn't to it? to live. God, sadly, he didn't live all that long. No, though. well, that's the issue mm. there, isn't it? But we, we, we touched on David Boy at the top, and what it's going to be quite difficult this in, for you uh, in some ways, this interview, because I'm going to be pinballing around because we've only got you for a short amount of time. There's so much to ask. You. But David Bowie, yeah. Mick Jagger, the Drew Lane Theatre, what yes. happened there? Well, we were doing Monty Python um, live at Drury Lane. It was our, our first, it was our live show in London. We'd done a sort of tour around the country. Uh, places like Sunderland and <laughs> Cardiff, and we were flushed with success. <laughs> so we said, let's go down market, and so we did Drury Lane Theatre. Um, and it became very, very popular. And one night we were on stage doing our silly stuff, you know, oh, you know, panning for the fjord. <laughs> and there, in the little box, bo right by the stage, in the very close to the stage boxes, there's Mick Jagger and David Bowie kind of sitting there with a chocolates and <laughs> watching the show. Oh, that's insane, isn't it? Yeah, it is Did that kind insane. of put you off your stroke a little bit, sort of? Because well, you love your music as well, don't you? So I would imagine that was a bit... Yeah, it was a bit... It was kind of awesome. But then we were in control there. We were doing yeah. our show. They'd come to see us. Yeah. Um, it was like when Jude Law came on the show for a week last Friday, you know. Oh, right, and he yeah. was... he. It's genuinely true, Michael. The early, earliest Hollywood film star... He was uh, a little bit starstruck to meet me, actually. Was he really? Yeah. yeah big fan yeah. of the programme. Well, he's, he, to be honest, dude, starstruck to meet anybody. <laughs> he's like He that, doesn't get he? out much, really. You know, he does a film, but he, you know, he said, well, I'm doing a film. Oh, come on, come down the pub. No, I've got to do a film. I've got to play Hamlet. Yeah. He doesn't get out a lot. So I think he's probably very, yeah. very lucky to meet you. He was like that with but the Chuckle Brothers. We had a lot of... I mean, music and Python was a very big yeah. connection for, for, for some reason. And... Um, one of, I mean, one of the first things we, whenever when we started Python, right at the very beginning, the first show went out October 1969, for God's sake, um, and we heard that Paul McCartney was then, I think he was starting Wings and all that, and yeah. 
he would actually, if they were doing a recording session in the evening, uh, he would actually stop <laughs> and everyone had to watch Monty Python half an hour, which when you've got the whole orchestra in there, probably cost him a fair <laughs> yeah. bit anyway. And then, of course, there was, there was George, yes. George Harrison. I was going to mention that, who, your, who, your connection. I mean, George said, um, when we got to know him, he said, on the first night of Py of the first show of Python, he sent a, a note to the BBC saying how great it was, you know, wonderful, and wanted to know a bit more about it. And we never got it. And I can just imagine that, you know, a message would come to the BBC desk <laughs> from George Harrison of the Beatles. It's a bit like someone says, oh, yeah, I'm the Duke of Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He probably threw it away. Father Christmas. Um, but <laughs> later, incredible. of course, he, later, of course, George became huge. Well, well you're interwoven, really, your, your histories, because right? Handmade Films, is, uh, he, he was part of, of all that, wasn't he? And um... Yeah, George created that with, um, with Dennis O'Brien, his manager, and they, they helped us make... Uh, they saved Life of Brian. Mm. I mean, it wouldn't have been made if George hadn't been yeah. around because uh, EMI dropped it like a hot brick when the, the head of the studio read the script. <laughs> some lower People lower down the organisation had got it all together and offered us some money and suddenly this man, I think, I can't remember what his name was, but anyway, it was the head of yeah. EMI. He said, have you read the script? And they said, yeah, it's very funny. Funny? <laughs> it's disgusting. We're not touching this. And they backed out and George came in, so... Good for him. Well, and and also there there was sort of in the seventies, especially when when Python, you know, when when the film started to come out and stuff, mm. you were it was proper rock star stuff, really. It was the Hollywood Bowl, um, and you know it, there was a link with Led Zeppelin at some point as well, wasn't there? Those yeah. guys and yourselves, kind of Led Zeppelin, Genesis, they all put a bit of money, not yeah. much. It was about four quid each <laughs> into Monty Python and the Holy Grail, but yeah. uh, again. You know, they saw in us, I think, something that, that the rock, uh, that, that was essential to rock music, yeah. a slightly subversive kind of trying to do something different, being a bit stroppy, being a bit difficult. Yeah. That's that they saw what they were trying to do in music, we were trying to do in, in comedy, and, yeah. and and they helped us out. And, and people like Harry Nilsson was a terrific fan. I mean, he, he, Harry came on stage with us once he, in one of the shows. We were doing a live show in Canada or something like that. Um, or maybe it was in the States, and he came on stage, and he was completely <laughs> plastered. You know, Brandy Alexander. Down. Yeah, and when the curtain came down at the end, we all took a bow, and the curtain came, and he was on, on the wrong side of the curtain. <laughs> we were all behind it. He was in front of it. So I think he fell into the orchestra pit and uh, had, to be, had to be restarted. The but, ultimate comedic end to a, to yes. a brilliant comedy show, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Harry, ne <laughs> Harry Nielsen shambling off stage with a, with a glass in his hand into the orchestra we, we pit. We should have had a... A rock star every night. Yeah, just so fall into the, the orchestra. The curtain, exactly, fall into the orchestra. <laughs> Ollie Murs, it would be now. Uh, mm. Just contemporary reference for the uh, for the listeners of the show. We, he fell off stage yeah, exactly. once, and we, we love it. it. We love it. Good. Um, but he was fine. We checked. Um, but to, to go back a little bit, uh, we, we're talking about um, it's going back as far as do not adjust your sets. This is where it started to kind of coalesce, really, isn't it, Python? David Frost was a real mm. uh, was, yeah. was a sort of talisman for you guys, wasn't he? Bringing you together. Would you yeah. say that? No, it was. A, a give David credit where it's due. He, he um, I suppose the, the turning point in my life was doing a review um, with the Oxford Review Group at Edinburgh. There was about five or six of us. And uh, it was Edinburgh Festival, 1964. And we wrote and performed the material. Um, and it wasn't to your own, you know, it wasn't your own university audience. This was to anyone who was yeah. around in Edinburgh. And it worked very well. It was a very successful show. And we had to put on extra performances. And that was the first time I really thought, hey, maybe I could do this as a as a, a job. I'm yeah. not quite sure how, but I'd written and I was performing and people were coming along and laughing. And David Frost came and sort of talent spotted. And um, two years later, as good as his word, he asked Terry Jones and myself, who were both in the review, if we'd write for a thing called The Frost Report, yes. which was a kind of a good upmarket comedy series. It had a theme each week, like take education or authority, which sounds a bit dry, but it gave it a nice sort of... Um, um, uh, uh, sort it of gives it a focus, it doesn't it? A focus. We, that, we all yeah. write our daft stuff. There were hundreds of writers on it. I mean, the, the roller caption went round so fast <laughs> that I couldn't tell my parents... that I, was, I couldn't persuade them I was on it. Was it? the tenth show. That's my old guy. Oh, I can't see. Get ready. So I'd have to get them ready. I'll get your glasses on. It's coming up now. Oh! <laughs> But we were there in amongst all these writers, and so were John Cleese and Graham Chapman and Eric Idle. Yeah. So, yeah, I suppose that's where we all really got to work together. And you've, you've said before um, that of, of all the, the guys that you, you know, when you performed together, all these different dynamics, and it is a bit like a rock band. It's a little bit 
very much like Queen in a sense, in that everybody writes and everybody performs. You know, it's not yeah. just two of the guys and everybody else. You all wrote together. But yeah. yourself and John had a lovely dynamic acting wise, didn't you? Because he tended to be the vociferous one and you you were quite good at being the sort of Yeah. The the, the I, foil to that. I used to irritate him. Which was great. <laughs> you know, that that's John's such a brilliant, brilliant comedy performer. And he's brilliant because you know, there's so much going on there. There's a kind of real frustration about yeah. life and everything to do with life, which is just bubbling under. Yeah. And all you've got to do is just poke it slightly with a finger in the tummy and say, oh, it'll go, it'll go completely. That's why Faulty Towers was so brilliant. So, you know, I just used to be the one who'd bat back all his phobias, you yeah. know, about the, the, the parrot, you know, yeah. this growing indignation. And my favourite is the cheese shop sketch, which is just, he just comes in and... Uh, wants to buy some cheese, and I don't have any. And he goes to that, because it's endless wonderful. It's all I have to say is no, 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 no. Oh, yes, uh, Wensleydale, yeah, Wensleydale, yes, yes. Um, I'll have some Wensleydale, please. Oh, I thought that meant me. I'm, I'm, my name's Wensleydale. No. <laughs> you do have some cheese, do you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it goes on and on. And it's a long sketch, and in the background are two guys playing balalaikas. Um, city gents playing balalaikas, playing this old Greek music. And it's only after about five minutes of the sketch, John suddenly turns around and says, Will you shut that up? So it's the brilliant building of all this yeah. sort of frustration with life, which is he echoes so well. So, yeah. yeah, I was just sort of... The two of us together sort of played well because I would get him into this state and wind him up. And, and he's a uh, he's ter terrific... Um, comedy performer. I don't mean to go on because I don't really like him. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I no. spoke very highly he, of you. He is, uh, you know, his pauses, his, the way he, he, he prepares for a line, even something silly like the fish slapping dance, yeah. which oh. is... It's one of your favourite bits, it, that, it's, it's made. It? It's made, I mean, I think it, it just works very well, but part of it is made by the fact that John just doesn't hit me with the pike when I finish slapping with pilchards. He put, brings the fish up and takes aim for a moment in a very military <laughs> yes. style, as though he'd been taught this at Sandhurst, and then whack and knocks me in. Straight into the lock. Brilliant touch. It's anyway, a, that's enough about John. Uh, exactly. I, I, I'm here today. We've had enough of that. You, John, um, John wasn't here for long, was he? he well, was that's last? right. <laughs> he only did about nine minutes, and then he we had to that. bum rush him out of the studio. He said um, that to me. He said, you know, I, I went on to <laughs> Six Music, and I, I really, it was one of those days I felt I wanted to tell him everything, this Sean guy. I have a lot to say and a new film and all that sort of thing, my marriage and all that. And I just got on to my second impersonation of um, Jerry Lee Lewis. And that's it. He suddenly looks straight past me and says, I've got to go now. That's is it. That, this this is, is what happened. Verbatim, and you left him in the studio. Just we just left him languishing. Off. I said, you know your way out. You know the BBC. No, um, he doesn't know his way out. He didn't. As it I saw out. him just in the passage there. He's awkward. Going spare. Nine months. Very long fingernails. <laughs> Very Extremely long awkward. Fingernails. <laughs>